Welcome to Maplewoodian.com podcast. We have on the phone Police Chief Robert Cimino. How are you doing, Chief? I am doing well, Joe. Great to have you on. Um, of course, we just wanted to chat about a few things. For those who don't know, now you've been Chief for 14 years? That is correct. 14. And uh, overall 33 years in the department? That's right. Wow. Years. So tell us how you, you got started since you've been with Maplewood Police since, I guess, 1981 then? That's right. Uh, sure, it took the test. uh was hired as a patrolman in 1981, and I uh, did uh, a variety of assignments as I uh, came through the ranks. I was in the, uh, at the time, the anti-crime uh, unit and then the uh, detective bureau. Uh, I became a patrol sergeant and then was a uh, field training supervisor for uh, the patrol division. I uh, was a uh, patrol lieutenant uh, continued to supervise the field training program in that uh, capacity. I also did the uh, uh, origination of the 911 system, brought that into the township when uh, the state uh, went to the 911 system. And um, What year was that? A lot of people don't realize, you know, people growing up, they don't realize we didn't have 911 right, uh, all the that, time. That, that program actually got to Maplewood about 1993. I was a sergeant when the program started and uh, finished it out. Full implementation was uh, done about, I would say, a year and a half, two years uh, after it started. So it was it, it, it was completed about 1993, I would say. And for those who don't know, you grew up in Orange, or in West Orange? Uh, both those In Orange and West Orange. Right. And then did you now, so did you, you graduated from West Orange High School. Do you, do you go directly into the police academy then or, or other uh, no, postgraduate? No, did a little, did a little uh, work at Kane College and mm-hmm. uh, then went back to school at Kane. Once I became a police officer, I, I got my uh, bachelor's degree in uh, management science from Kane and then uh, a few years later uh, went to uh, Seton Hall and got my master's from Seton Hall University. So you do have a master's degree? I do. Excellent. And then where did you go to Police Academy? Police Academy was... Uh, Essex County? Essex County Academy, right, in Cedar Grove. So it's, uh, you know, been a, a nice progression and uh, a good a good career for me. And then, so you become chief uh, when? 2000? 2000. 2000, right. It was uh, July of 2000. Now, how much has, have things changed, do you think, in Maplewood... Safety-wise, and, and from a police standpoint, from when you first started in '81, well, were things safer you know, then, tougher there, then? There was a lot of uh, a lot of changes in technology for yeah. sure. Uh, but I think if you go back and look at the statistics uh, from the '90s, mm-hmm. I don't recall exactly the stats from the '80s, but in the uh, late '90s, uh, we did have a much higher uniform crime report uh, mm. crime. Uh, statistic than we do today. So crime has actually gone down over those years. Um, we had uh, a lot more motor vehicle thefts, and uh, I think a lot of that has changed due to the uh, improvement in technologies that, that are out there. So our car theft rate was much, much higher, and uh, we had years of um, many more burglaries than we do today. Um, and there were more efforts at uh, generating the neighborhood watch programs in the 80s because there was such a uh, a higher degree of burglary. And uh, when we did, as a department, achieve more buy-in from the community at that time, uh, it did have an effect on lowering the burglaries. And that's why we've tried that effort again in the last uh, few years because as people have been concerned about burglary, uh, we reverted back to something that we knew had worked for us in those uh, prior years and uh, tried to organize more neighborhood watch groups. And we continue to do that today because we think it is an effective uh, aid in in combating uh, burglary and and other neighborhood issues as well. People looking out for each other is always a help for the police. And, you know, that's kind of the concept of community-oriented policing. It's building partnerships uh, with the members of the community. And uh, that's something that we continually strive to do today. And I know you always preach community involvement when you go to neighborhood meetings and at, at the township committee meetings. Um, what is it about the community involvement that maybe for people who don't think about, oh, I, I can do something extra, what would you tell them to do, whether it's organizing or even just dealing directly with the police in terms of, of really keeping that, that effort to have community policing? Well, I mean, that's certainly everyone's uh, individual choice, but right. we, we promote as 
in many uh, things as a person who's a, a member of the community is willing to do, whether that is the things you mentioned, which are uh, either join or start a neighborhood watch for your individual block uh, or be a set of eyes for the community in a non-organized way and just pick up the phone. If you see something, say something. I mean, that uh, that idea really found its roots uh, right after the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, but the concept is one of general uh, safety for any community. So if there is something that a person sees that they believe is uh, of a concern to them, this is of a suspicious nature, then they should call us. And that's what we're, we are here here for so that we can investigate, uh, we can determine whether something is amiss or whether, in fact, there's a, a reasonable explanation for what that person's mm -hmm. concerns were. So just those two things alone would be a great start in, uh, you know, building that partnership. And we have a variety of programs available to people. We have officers that will come out and do home security surveys. Uh, the officers will walk around the person's home and give them some pointers on different ways they can better protect their home and their property. Uh, so that's another thing that we offer to people. We encourage people to take advantage of that. Uh, it's a free service. Uh, we do it when we have the time to be able to do that, so it's uh, not an additional cost to the town, but it certainly aids in preventing some of the crime uh, that may occur. So that's uh, <clears throat> another thing another option that uh, that they have. Uh, we also have a police auxiliary unit where we have officers that uh, are given training. They come out. They get a uniform. Uh, it is based on the concept of the emergency management organization throughout the state. Uh, so our auxiliary officers go out and they train for major incidents where we can then activate them and use them as a resource. Uh, some people choose to do that. We still have an active uh, cadre of auxiliaries that we rely on in snow emergencies and major events. So that's another way that people can get involved in uh, partnering with the police. We have uh, other volunteer uh, activities that people can get involved in, either you know on a small uh, way from time to time or on a larger scale with something like the police auxiliary. So if anybody has any interest in that, they should, you know, give a call to our main number and they could be referred to uh, the uh, crime prevention unit and we can give them some direction from there based upon what their, uh, what their interests are in getting involved. So the average person just... I think a lot of people don't realize if they if they do see something uh, concerning, they can call in first. Can they can call in anonymously? Correct. And not Absolutely. Anyone? No. <clears throat> Absolutely. Right. I, we, uh, as a part of our procedures, request to get the name of an individual because it aids us right. later on if we can go back and verify who is making the call. However, it is not a requirement. So when a person does hear that, we don't want them to feel. Um, is strained or intimidated by the fact that the dispatcher will ask that question. It's a, it's a procedural uh, question that we ask uh, so that we can obtain the information if possible. However, we want to get whatever it is that they're concerned about uh, communicated to us, and that's the bottom line. So if they wish to remain anonymous, they can certainly say that to the dispatcher and continue to make their report because it's most important for us and for the community's safety overall is to get the information um, communicated to us and then have an officer go into the area where the concern is so that the officer can then further the investigation. And as I indicated, sometimes people are concerned about things uh, that uh, they may be uh, worried about but in fact do not amount to a crime or do not amount to something that can be investigated further, but that's for the officer to, to determine. So we would prefer to have the information reported and then be able to investigate it further on our own through our professional officers. Right, and I, I've told you, and people who read our website, they know we, we follow, I follow the police scanner, and it's very impressive to hear the professionalism that goes on on the scanner. There's calls coming in. It's really interesting, too, to see just all the work. I don't think a lot of people realize how much the police respond to uh, the, the calls will come in. There's a suspicious person, um, and you'll hear the response. The police will stop. They'll find out what the person's doing, and it's fine. Or, you know, they run their name. They're a warrant for arrest on this or for that, or they something else is found, and they uh, 
we'll we'll have to take them in, and that's again many times as you know better than I. But just hearing the scanner, a lot of it is people calling in and saying, "Look, you know something's not right here." I've had people call in, uh, people parked in front of my house. Someone, a neighbor called and said, "There's a, you know someone's parked in front of the house," and I'm hearing my address, and I go, "What's that?" And I go out, and it turns out it's it's someone uh, who was waiting to do work for me, and the police came. They talked to us. They were really nice, you know, no hassles, and and they uh, left. But there was other calls that come in where it, they stop someone looking in the window, and uh, you, they track them down later, and they arrest them for trespassing or a warrant, or and and it's it's really a reminder how much the the average person calling in, and it's not as if the police in this town will abuse that. Whereas we know that can happen in some places. You really don't find that. Um, but how do you, you know, attest the professionalism that the police in this town have? Is it training? Is it just you guys knowing which police to hire versus not because of the way they approach things? Because I've never come across, and we don't hear examples, really, of, of unprofessional behavior or, or problems that, you know, we've heard in other, in other towns, sadly, in recent times. Well, you know, first off, Joe, it, you know, I think it's uh, it's important to recognize uh, our officers are human beings, but we do go through a very involved process in recruiting and then vetting our officers. Uh, they get psychological backgrounds done. They get uh, criminal background investigations that are conducted. We do very thorough interviews with them to try to get uh, the best handle on the type of person that we are bringing on to the department uh, so that that person really um, holds the same values that we believe the community is looking for and trying to maintain in its police force. So uh, along with that, then the people that pass through that uh, phase of the process then get uh, full accredited training through the Police Training Commission at a local police academy. Uh, usually we use Essex, but it could be other academies uh, throughout the state. Um, and then once that officer is on, we are then training them to our local standards and local ways. They are given a field training officer. That officer is a experienced officer who's been working for the department for a while, and they then uh, have that person assimilate into the Maplewood Police Department. We teach them about our mission statement, our values um, as an organization, which all reflect the fairness and uh, community-oriented policing concepts that we want our officers to uh, embody and then uh, emulate when they go out into the community. Now, how many officers do you have now total in the department? Uh, right is now, that up or down in recent years? I know there's some layoffs or uh, cutbacks a few years ago. That's right. been pretty pretty ste steady in terms of we haven't really had cuts in the budget, and, and have you even increased in recent years? Right. We just we just recently uh, increased uh, to uh, 63. Mm -hmm. From uh, 60, we had been at, uh, 60 for quite a while, right. and uh, we currently have some officers in the academy, so we really won't have all of our uh, full complement out and working on the road uh, until uh, a couple months from now into the early part of 2015, but uh, that is uh, our current staffing, and uh, you know we're, we use... Uh, our resources, our, our staff, and our officers are certainly our most valuable resource. Uh, we try to use them as uh, the best we can, and we put our officers out into areas where we are seeing the potential for crime through information that we get from our, our partner and uh, neighboring communities, and we also base that on where crime is actually occurring in certain neighborhoods. We track the crime. We map our crime uh, so that we can see if there is a trend developing in a particular neighborhood where cars are being broken into at night or there's homes that are being burglarized. We try to adapt our patrol patterns and our staffing to meet those needs best so that we can protect the community. So if you have 60 officers, what is the deployment like? Are they working eight-hour shifts or 10-hour shifts for four days? I know some fire departments work that way. What is sort of the scheduling deployment? Well, w without getting into specifics, the, the general patrol division, mm -hmm. which are the uh, officers that are answering calls, right. um, 
work a nine hour fifty five minute day ah, okay. and they work uh, four days on and three days off ah. and we also have uh, more specialized units traffic units mm-hmm. we have uh, uh, walking post officers and we have some uh, crime suppression team officers that work a different schedule uh, some of those officers are working five days on and two days off and they work a shorter day uh, but essentially, it's a, a combination of schedules so that mm-hmm. we could try to cover the uh, areas and the days that fit the crime patterns best. Mm-hmm. And basically, it's, it's a lot of patrolling in the cars, not so much a foot patrol. Well, we do have given to, the size of the town we have, I guess. Right, right. But we do we do have foot patrol posts, mm-hmm. and we use those uh, selectively. We have some uh, times that we have the officers walking on Springfield Avenue. We have sure. time that we have an officer walking on Irvington Avenue. Mm-hmm. We have a period of time where we have officers walking in Maplewood Village, and uh, we try to uh, coordinate those times with the times when there are, um, you know, higher volumes of foot traffic in those particular areas. And from time to time, we have specialized uh, assignments when uh, we want to show a greater number of officers in a particular area uh, to try to deter, you know, particular types of crime depending upon the time, date, and place. Excellent. We're talking to Police Chief Robert Semino who has been chief for 14 years. Um, and what are the, now one of the things we always see in the police blotter is whenever there's an arrest, in most cases, it is not someone from Maplewood. You have the criminal element comes from elsewhere. I think a lot of people assume because you're near, we, we border Irvington, we border Newark to a degree, we border Vauxhall, very, you know, tough neighborhoods, high crime areas. How do you sort of police those edges um, and, and, and really deal with a lot of, Criminals who, and especially Springfield Avenue, I would assume, uh, is a passageway in some cases. Or is that is that a wrong assumption that that those bordering towns are, are much of the problem? Well, you know, it, we we really don't police based on on the borders, mm-hmm. uh, so to speak. But we we do deploy officers based upon where we have information of potential threats. Mm-hmm. Um, based upon the communications we have with our surrounding communities and also uh, reports generated by the county prosecutor's office and the state police. So, uh, you know, there are geographic assignments. There are posts where officers are responsible for a particular patrol area. But in addition to that, we will have officers spend extra time in areas where we have seen a... uh, what what looks to be a trend or a rise in a particular type of crime in a particular neighborhood or or series of streets. So that's really how we do deploy. And and the the type of policing we do is based on behaviors observed. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we're not really looking at a particular town or, uh, you know, uh, using a a particular area as a, uh, a cause to put extra people there Mm -hmm. but it really amounts to the reports that we are getting either from our citizens Mm -hmm. or developed through intelligence with other law enforcement agencies uh, or behaviors observed by our officers that indicate uh, some some type of suspicious activity. What have been some of the trends in neighborhoods in recent months or the last year? Uh, Well, we've had, you know, and it it is a... um, it is uh, more of a, a flexing and dynamic mm-hmm. situation. Over years and times, the neighborhoods will change because, right. unfortunately, uh, the one thing we've known about criminal activity is that it will adapt and displace. Mm-hmm. So uh, we've had periods where we had break-ins into cars uh, mm-hmm. along the uh, northeast section of town and then running along uh sections of Boyden Avenue, and when we've deployed our resources there, made some arrests and had extra patrols in those areas, we have seen also uh, a period of time where we had some break-ins into cars on the west side of town Mm -hmm. uh, between Ridgewood Road and up uh, into the Wyoming area. So those things change as we adapt to what we've seen with crime and make some arrests and do additional patrolling. So it becomes something that we have to adapt to on a uh, an ongoing basis. And there was a uh, time in recent uh, years, 
and Jacoby Street had a had a had a string of problems. I know there were some meetings held there. Um, what what was occurring, and how has that seemed like it's been it's been improved? Well, we've seen an improvement there uh, overall. I mean, we had a number of uh, disorderly conduct complaints right. that were being reported by the residents there. Uh, things from loud music, litter. Uh, groups congregating, uh, blocking the sidewalk, uh, high traffic in the area, speeding complaints. Uh, over time, we have done a variety of things where we've increased some uh, patrol resources in the area. We've put emphasis on reducing the traffic complaints, and we've seen a reduction in the uh, number of overall uh, disorderly complaints and uh, suspicious person complaints in that general neighborhood. So we feel that by, uh, you know, putting that uh, resource in there and, and doing that consistently over a period of time, we have seen a reduction in that. But it continues to be an area that challenges us, and mm -hmm. we continue to put officers there uh, on a, a periodic basis and increase the coverage there at certain times. So as we come to the end of 2014, what are, what are sort of, what's sort of the crime rate been this year? What's been up? What's been down? Well, I know the, officers, the stats are still coming in, but just sort of anecdotally. Sure. The, the officers uh, have done a great job this year. We are looking at about a 16% reduction in crime overall as compared to 2013 uh, for the year. Overall meaning what? Just yeah, all, major all reportable crimes? crimes? Well, when we talk about those, we usually talk about the Uniform Crime Reporting right. Crimes, or Part 1, and those crimes include homicide, rape, robbery, assault, burglary, larceny, motor vehicle theft, and mm -hmm. arson. Those are the major uh, the major categories. And the... Uh, you know, the areas that usually concern people most are burglaries to homes, sure. street robberies, because, you know, robberies, there's a threat or use of force involved. Um, and unfortunately for us, uh, the robberies have been an issue because there is a, a great interest by the criminals on the street with mm. taking smartphones. Right. We always I read about those in the blotter. It's, right. A weapon was displayed and smartphone taken, and it's odd since I would think most cases, if someone steals a smartphone, it's out of commission. They can't use it unless they get caught, although they may be able to sell it, I guess. Exactly. They are, they're selling them. There's a, there is a uh, kind of a secondary market out there for, mm -hmm. for the phones. It's not so much for the use, although they do use them periodically, mm -hmm. uh, but it's more about the value of that phone right. uh, either sold uh, into different channels or possibly even for uh, its, its scrap value. But they certainly are one of the primary uh, causes for the street robberies. And, uh, you know, we've continually tried to encourage through a variety of means, through the media, with community meetings, uh, people to be more aware of their surroundings. Uh, in this day and age, because of the, you know, popularity of these smartphones, a lot of people are walking around with earbuds, they are texting mm -hmm. friends, they are making uh you know, use of that smartphone as they're walking and their head's not up, their eyes are fixed on the phone, and they can be approached easily from behind. Uh, and sometimes that's how those, uh, you know, those street encounters uh, turn into robberies. So it's almost as if you, you don't take out your cell phone, smartphone, unless you're in an area that would be considered safe or unless you're uh, observant, I guess. Like you said, if you're walking down the street texting, someone drives by, and they might pull over, grab it, and go. Yeah, I mean it's it's a matter of awareness. You know, yeah. you can't you know you can't predict every situation, but uh, we encourage people to you know minimize that use uh, to the degree that they could be uh, more aware of their surroundings and try not to make it as obvious to any potential uh, you know criminals out there that hey, I've got an expensive smartphone in my hand and this this is a, a you know creating an opportunity for uh, being victimized. Another thing that always comes up, and again, I appreciate your time. I'll, I'm sure you're busy. We'll We'll wrap it up soon in a moment. Um, the thing that I always see that it really knows no boundaries are thefts from auto uh, and burglaries. And you said already the police will come out and give your house a, a check on on burglary or safety access. But what would you sort of say to people? Is it just lock your car door or don't leave expensive things in the car? Sure. As, theft as, from auto? as a... Uh as a quick crime prevention, uh, you know, set of uh, things to do, uh, 
increase lighting around the house and uh, in the driveway. Maybe a motion sensor light would be a great thing to have so that, uh, you know, potential criminals are put off by uh, by being uh, observed, so lights always help. Locking your car, not leaving valuables visible from outside the car and not leaving valuables in the car. Um, so those are probably a couple of the primary things. And then in terms of uh, home security, uh, getting very good locking systems and a super striker plate on the doors so that they're not easily forced open, making sure that, uh, you know, to the extent you can, uh, you make the home look occupied and don't let it look unoccupied mm-hmm. by leaving mail or newspapers piling up outside the a house. super striker, what's that for those who don't know? A super striker plate is, uh, the striker plate is the device that is on the door jam that accepts mm-hmm. the bolt of the lock mm-hmm. when you lock your door. Now, the common striker plate that's included with a basic locking system is usually maybe about three inches, and uh, it's a very basic type of uh, metal piece. Super striker plates are much larger. They can handle more force, so it's a, it is uh, capable of withstanding more pressure if someone is trying to push through that lock into the house. Mm-hmm. And you're a fan of home security alarm systems, or sure, is that not a, a def, we, is that a requirement in many kids? Do you think, or just a good extra it, idea? It's a good, it's a good idea. Yeah. If people can afford to, uh, you know, have an alarm system in their home, we find that they're very effective. Uh, certainly not a guarantee, but it is certainly better than not having one. Uh, and you know, those are those are some of the basics. And as I indicated earlier, if uh, someone has an interest. Uh, we encourage them to give a call, and we'll have an officer come out and do a home security survey and make some more specific recommendations for that individual home. And one more thing on the burglaries. What is the most uh, common accessible uh, approach for burglaries? Is it breaking the door, breaking a window, looking for an unlocked door? Well, those are all three that are common, okay? So back doors, uh, open doors, uh, low windows, those are all places that a burger could use. And one thing I could add to that that really speaks to the issue of, you know, if you see something, say something. Uh, a lot of times before a burglar will enter a home, they're going to try to determine if someone is at home because most right. burglars do not want to confront anyone. Mm-hmm. They want to just be able to go in the home and steal what they can steal of value. Mm-hmm. So they will ring a doorbell, and they'll try to determine if the person is home and mm-hmm. come to the door. When someone's ringing a doorbell in a neighborhood and there's not a good reason for them to be there and they make up an excuse that they were at a wrong house or they were just looking for something else, that is a good reason to call the police. Right, and I've heard those on the scanner too. Right, get us to double check whether that person is really at the wrong house or maybe, in fact, they are using that as a ruse to... um, to check the home to see if it's occupied. So the criminal isn't necessarily breaking into your house. They'll ring the bell, you answer, they'll make a birth excuse. Right, and if they go... And they might go to the next house, I see. They may find that house is empty, so that's a great aid for us to be able to follow up on. If a person sees that someone's going from door to door in a neighborhood... um, and uh, or they're, they're ringing doorbells and, and making excuses about why they happen to be at the home and they're not canvassing for a business or they don't have a cause to be there. Those are all things that we would prefer to investigate. And then quickly on the neighborhood watch. Now, if people want to set up a neighborhood watch program, how do they do that and what is that? Well, neighborhood watch is just a group of neighbors watching out for each other and right. you know, using some of the techniques that we just talked about mm-hmm. to watch each other's homes. Uh, and the way to do that is to call our crime prevention unit, and the sergeant in charge of that right now is Detective Sergeant Albert Sally. And they can call the main number, and the dispatchers will direct them to the crime prevention unit, and uh, they can leave a message there, and there will be a follow-up. And it sounds like it's as simple as the, the community gets together and uh, learns how to keep an eye for each other. If someone goes on vacation, maybe they tell everyone and they keep an eye on their home, that kind of thing. Exactly. Right. Exactly. You okay. know your neighbors best. We, As much as the officers know the community in general terms, the people that are living on a particular street and, you know, uh, interact with their neighbors more frequently are going to know, you know, who's a visitor and who's a stranger way better than a police officer is. 
One more thing I wanted to ask, and again, we're talking to you, uh, Chief Robert Semino. We appreciate your time. Um, youth crime, whether it's youth vandalizing types of crime or crime in the schools, we know about the lockdown at Columbia in recent weeks, which I think most people would judge was handled extremely well. Um, what is sort of the status of, of, of crime, whether it's in the schools or drug use or just typical kind of youth vandalism type juvenile delinquency issues. You don't see a lot of it in this town, but maybe, you know, we still have young people who, are, are they getting more into trouble than they used to or less? What's sort of the status there? Yeah. It's sort of a broad thing, I know, but... It, it is, and overall, I can tell you that I don't think we've seen any um, any serious spike in any one particular mm. type of youth crime or uh any spike in drug abuse or anything of that nature. I think we've had a fairly consistent amount of, uh, you know, uh, activity of youth. I mean, uh, we understand that kids are they're growing, they're going to get involved in things, and we mm -hmm. hope that it's not a, of a serious nature. But uh, we are not looking at anything year to year that gives me an indication that we have a particular area of crime being committed by youth that is... Uh, much greater than what what has been happening in prior years. But we, we watch all the categories. And to be fair to Columbia High School, and I'll, I'm a parent. I have a daughter who's going to go into Columbia next year. You know, Columbia has a has a little bit of a scary uh, image because it is so big. Um, although you don't hear, I don't think about a lot of criminal activity more than than any other suburban high school. But what would you say to the parent who might say, "Oh, that's such a big school. It has some. You know, it's had problems like the lockdown." Uh, what would you say to maybe ease concerns if, if that's the image they have unfairly? Well, I mean, you know, I think I think any school could be touched by crime, yeah. and I think the uh, the advantage that we have in uh, Maple with Columbia High School is we have a, a, a very uh, competent set of administrators and yes. school officials who interact with us. They we have a great line of communication. We try to uh, identify issues before they turn into uh, you know large problems for anyone in the school community. And I think that's the uh, the best message that I could give them that uh, you know we as uh, the police department and the school administrators consistently strive to create the the most safe environment possible for the kids of this community. Do you have police regularly assigned there, or is that not necessary? Well, it's uh, we, we used to have school resource officers assigned into right. the school, uh, but we no longer have that on a, a continual basis. But we do have officers periodically assigned on uh, certain days, certain times, and mm -hmm. our Youth Aid Bureau officers, who are really detectives, they're plainclothes uh, detectives, uh, they have frequent contact with the school officials throughout ah. the week and throughout the days. They are in that school multiple times uh, throughout the week, sometimes daily, uh, and they are interacting and speaking with the school officials about incidents that are, uh, you know, of a concern to them, uh, be it, uh, you know, concerns about, uh, you know, attendance or just, uh, you know, some uh, thefts that may have occurred or things of that nature, but uh, there is a frequent communication between our department and the uh, the school officials, and we, we keep that line of communication open. And one more quick thing, and I I'm sorry, I keep saying that, but I keep coming up with things I want to ask you about, but I don't want to waste your time. You know in the last couple of years there was a, the concern uh, at Tuscan, the reporter who gained access, and as a reporter I was not a fan of what he did, but it did bring up a concern about access to the schools. There's been some changes made which probably weren't needed. I don't think anyone would think that our schools were that unsafe. Um, what's your thought on the way that the school district is handling um, entry to schools, and are you a fan or foe of metal detectors if they were to be used in any, I don't think they've really been discussed, but... Well, in terms of the, the response from the, uh, the school district and the schools uh, to that incident with the reporter gaining entry, I, I think they have, uh, you know, made a, a good effort, and I think they've uh, gone along in a uh, methodical way to improve security. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in this day and age, all parents are concerned about people having access to the schools, uh, and understandably so. We've had some terrible incidents throughout the country. We hope they never happen here. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that the school responded uh, proportionately to the, uh, the concerns. And uh, with respect to metal detectors, I, I don't believe that, uh, you know, we're, we're at a point where we're seeing 
an indication that there's uh, you know weapons being possessed in right. school at any great rate that would uh, be cause for that. But that would be the school's decision, and you know mm-hmm. we would certainly uh, you know meet with them and and give them our uh, you know our uh, impressions with respect to any uh, policy that they wanted to institute like that, but uh, that would really be a Board of Ed decision. Excellent. Well, Chief Robert Smith, we thank you for your time, um, and you you're, you're uh, have a good number of decades in Maplewood. We hope uh, you're not going to leave anytime soon, I hope. <laughs> Nothing planned soon. You know, it's, a, it's a challenging job, but it's a very, it's a very uh, gratifying uh, job, and uh, I really I'm proud to have the uh, the fine men and women of the Maplewood Police Department uh, to uh, to work with on a daily basis. They uh, they really extend themselves. I think they do a great service for the community, and uh, like I said, I'm I'm very proud to be the chief of a department like this. Anything to look forward to in, in 2015 that you might want to. Let us know about the upcoming. Well, we're we're going to continue. We're going to continue along the same path. We mm-hmm. uh, we will always look to uh, to improve. We just got recertified as an accredited uh, law enforcement agency through the State Chiefs Association. So we'll continue to use uh, and explore more best practices. And again, if anyone has basically anything you want to ask about, report it. Something suspicious, help out. Community watch. Call. Don't call 911, obviously, because that's for emergencies only, but call the uh, main numbers, and I know I do it. I call, and they answer promptly, and uh, the, you know, the department's there to help in more ways than most people might realize, um, but I'm sure we definitely realize it. And we appreciate your time, and we will uh, keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.